there's a way to make an entrance. <laughs> My destiny. It was now a conspiracy of witches. Download Veely today. Experiencing great food is one of the best things about visiting a new city. But how can you be sure that you find the real gems? Good afternoon, ladies. Is everything all right? I'm Fred Syriax. Do you enjoy your desserts? And I've been working in the restaurant business for over 30 years. I'm a seasoned professional. And even for me, it's difficult to find amazing places to eat. So I've asked four of Britain's most celebrated chefs and restaurateurs to open up their little black books and take me to their all-time favorite places to eat. I mean, look at this place. I have no idea it existed. You are with the cool guy. John Carriage, man. <laughs> this is the best tortilla in the world. It is a meal fit for kings. Together, we'll travel to some of the world's most exciting food destinations. Woo! This is one of the best meals I've had for a very long time. But we won't just be eating. How are you? Great, how are you? Great to meet you. We'll be meeting the people behind the scenes. I've been wanting to meet somebody like you for so many years. Please, <laughs> please. And rolling up our sleeves. You are like a butcher. To find out how they deliver perfect service. Everybody is waiting for the Frenchman to drop the tray. World-class food. Ooh. This is what Paris is all about. And an experience you'll never forget. Oh, this is a little pig's head. They make you feel special. This is rare. It's a thing of pure beauty. This week, I'm in Paris, the birthplace of gastronomy. And there is no better guy than my old boss and friend, Michel Roux Jr. Break these up a bit. Let's just cut them in half. I learned the tricks of the trade working for Michel in his two Michelin starred Mayfair restaurant, where he's been a lifelong disciple of classic French cuisine. For me, Paris is just such a, a vibrant, electric city. But even for me, who's been hundreds of times, I've worked there, I've got family there. It's constantly evolving, but always with great respect for their past. Fred is French, but I'm sure I can show him a thing or two about Paris that he doesn't know. Wow, l'Arc de Triomphe. I'm in Paris with Michel Roux Jr. I mean, <laughs> it doesn't get any better than that. Paris in all its glory. Michel, you're going to see how good my driving is. Because once you drive around the Arc de Triomphe, I mean, you can drive anywhere. And you know what the best thing about this car? You don't have to wear the seat belt. Because if it was made like this, you can just drive it the way it was. Are you sweating? Yes, Fred. <laughs> Paris is as much the capital of gastronomy as it is of France. In 2010, French gastronomy specifically was given UNESCO heritage status. Eating out is a national pastime. And here, in the capital, there are over 40,000 restaurants, bistros and brasseries, ranging from amazing food stores and cafes to the top end with over 100 Michelin-styled restaurants. But it's a reputation that's not always been easy to maintain. Do you think Paris still got it? If I'm honest, I think Paris gastronomically lost its way a bit. Really? For a, yeah, for 10, 20 years or so. But now it's vibrant. It's got heritage. Paris has most definitely got it, and got it in buckets. The first place in Michel's little black book is on the left bank of the Seine, on the edge of the city's Latin Quarter. So I'm taking it to somewhere that just epitomizes la grande cuisine, and for me is the most iconic restaurant of Paris. It's got history, it's got the location, it's got great classic French food. I'm taking you to La Tour d'Argent. Oh, wow. You know what, I've always wanted to go there since I'm 16. I mean, it's one of the oldest restaurants in Paris. It is. La Tour d'Argent, the Silver Tower, is so famous in France that even I know its history. It first opened as an inn in 1582 and has been the place to indulge in French fine dining ever since. Here we go, La Tour d'Argent. Fantastic. <laughs> Six stories and that's where you dine, up there. 
So exciting, so exciting. It's been in the same family since 1911 and was moved to the top floor of its spectacular landmark building in 1936 to make the most of its position overlooking Notre Dame. Après vous, monsieur. Bonjour. Bonjour, monsieur. Bonjour. Bonjour. Bienvenue. Bonjour. 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 Merci. Welcome to La Tour d'Argent. Thank you very What much. What are you doing today? Very good. It feels very formal to me right now. Well, it is. There is a formality. Even you are like whispering. Yes. But there is a formality about this place. There's a certain respect for its past. But, you know, for me, how are they going to approach that formality and that respect for the past whilst looking to the future? Sure, that is true. But as a guest, I still want to enjoy it. I can't get over the fact that you haven't worn a tie. <laughs> you look like my granddad. <laughs> formality like this may come across as stuffy. Men have to wear jackets. But when you see who's eaten here in the past, you'll understand why. Her Majesty the Queen. Wow. wow. I love the fact that you know, you're taking a journey to the dining room. You build up the, the anticipation. Yes. You feel the weight of history. The sumptuous dining rooms are said to have some of the best views in Paris. And Michel's favorite table takes it all in. This is spectacular. And how romantic. It is romantic, isn't it? This is a, a, a very special occasion restaurant. You don't just pop in for your lunch break, do you? No. I love the formality of it. I love getting dressed up for the occasion. You know, my menu doesn't have a price. What about yours? Mine has. Let me see. No. The reservation is under my name. I am inviting you. You should have no sight of what I'm paying, because it's just not done. I had a glimpse, I can see, my eyesight is very good. I know what you've ordered, I can see there, it starts with a two. <laughs> and it's not 20 quid. I took the liberty of pre-ordering the duck, because you have to order it in advance. I hope you don't mind, it's to share. No, that's perfect. If you come to La Tour d'Argent, you've got to have the duck. The duck is an eye-watering 130 euros a person for two courses, but this is one of the most celebrated dishes in France. It's been on the menu since 1890 and attracts diners from all over the world. The other big draw is the legendary wine cellar. May I introduce our small wine list? Small <laughs> wine bible. <laughs> this is a wine list. <laughs> and look at all these different vintages. I mean, that must be intimidating for some people. You just don't know what to choose, and then you can see these prices. 13 grand. Wow. Shall we have that for dessert? I like you, but I don't like you that much, OK? Come on. You don't have to spend that much. Prices start at 60 euros a bottle, but we are keeping costs down and ordering by the glass. Oh, lovely. That's nice. That's lovely. lovely. Beautiful. Bonjour, uh -huh. monsieur. Bonjour. Bonjour. Mm. Oh. So this is the uh, Canard Tour d'Argent. Beautiful. Gosh, that smells so good. It does. Merci. Merci à vous. The roast duck is famously prepared at the table. Once it's been carved, the juice from the carcass is extracted using a heavy silver press. And now to this wonderful contraption, the press. And look at that, how much pressure he puts. All that lovely juice. And that's incredible, this gentleman here is actually doing the chef's job. He's making the sauce yes. in front of the customer. It makes it really special and it connects the front of house to the kitchen. Exactly. You know, and shows, you know, how much of a professional you need to be in order to work in front of house. You know, it's that performance, you know, it's, it's that theater, you know, and it, it's just fun. The rich sauce laced with cognac and Madeira wine is poured over the duck breast to create the first of our two courses. Mm. The sauce is rich rich in flavor, but actually the whole dish itself is not rich. It's not heavy. No. Chef, how many stars do they have here at all the They've been demoted. Really? From three to two, and now one. I mean, they've been going since, I mean, 1582. Do they actually need stars? I think it, it, there's a certain element of pride. Maybe it's time to look at the old classic recipes like the canard à la presse and just Modernize them slightly. Our second course is duck leg, served with fresh almonds and turnips. 
It's far more contemporary. And I wonder if this is part of the chef's strategy for regaining those lost Michelin stars. This is not what I expected, because the old recipe was literally just the crispy leg yeah. with a bit of salad. That's it. That's what I was expecting. And this is a much more modern interpretation. Mm. It's got a very Asian feel to it, mm. doesn't it? Yeah. Huh? Loads of different textures. Sweet, a little bit sour. Reminiscent of this oisin sauce, isn't mm. it? This is taking me completely by surprise, and I absolutely love it. As a memento of the great occasion, every customer receives a certificate with their personal duck number on. It's there. This one is to add to my collection. It's 1 million, 164, 223. Brilliant. <laughs> I mean, it's not cheap. There must be at least 20 front of house and at least 20 chefs as well. All this has a cost. And it's reflected within the price of the menu. It's not just the price of the ingredient that you pay for. This is something that will be a memory for us. Forever. A meal here is certainly expensive, but this is an iconic destination restaurant. Three and a half thousand diners ate here last year, many of whom came for the wine as well as for the food. The seven kilogram wine list contains some of the most treasured vintages in the world. I want to know how the restaurant can cope with the challenges of organizing such a vast collection. Ooh, a bit chilly here. So we are going down to the cellars to meet Ed Sommelier, an old friend of Michel's, David Ridgway. David! Who has been in charge here for almost 40 years. Who is it? <laughs> Do you always lock yourself in when you work? I'm afraid what might happen when people come down in the lift. <laughs> After you. <laughs> Thank yeah, you. Put this on, it's yeah, cold down here. I think here. we need it, it is chilly. Oh. What temperature is it, David? We're about 12 and a half degrees centigrade. Is it perfect environment for a It's salad? a good temperature to keep the wine a long time. The warmer it is, the quicker it ages. It may be cold enough to merit a woolly waistcoat, but this is said to be the most technically perfect cellar in the city. Oh, la, la. This is so big. I've never seen anything like this. This is truly extraordinary. Row upon row of bottles dating back to the 1800s. So, David, how many bottles do you have here? We have about 320,000 bottles, which is 15,000 different wines. 15,000 different wines. So, uh, how often do you buy wines? Every day. Every day. <laughs> we sell wine every day, so we have to buy wine every day. Many have been down here for decades, even centuries, where the darkness keeps them from losing their color. But they wouldn't be here were it not for some quick thinking from the owners. This was bricked up during the war in 1940 to protect it from the occupier during the war by Claude Terrail, the father of André Terrail. He flew from Bron, which is near Lyon, where he was a pilot. He flew back during the night, they bricked it up, and he flew back to Bron the following day. So what was he saved the... the wine. Wow, what a clever man. Unbelievable. Saved from Nazi invaders, the collection grew in the post-war years and since 1981, David has been its loving curator, leading the team of seven sommeliers. How do you do it as a sommelier to know what a person wants or doesn't want? How do you advise people on the right choice of wine? I, the best thing is to ask a few key questions, like how do you feel, what do you want, something lighter, fuller. Generally, when you say do you want something lighter, they don't mean they want it lighter in strength of wine, they mean they want it lighter in price. You, you try to avoid talking of, of money because it's slightly vulgar, but the price range can be so astronomic, you have to make sure that they know the price that they're paying. What is your yearly budget for buying wine? Half a million euros. It could be double that if the vintage is worth it. Mm. 2017 for us was average. We didn't buy very much. 2018 looks good. Mm. Should be some great wines. We can buy, buy double. An Englishman in Paris, in charge of this magnificent cellar. But it's not possible. <laughs> you know what I mean? Don't tell anybody. <laughs> A large part of the bill here could be for the wine, and bottles range from 60 euros to 25,000 euros. I mean, one case of that, and you can probably buy a car. Two cases, you get a nice car. 
65% of the wine is Burgundy, and there are over 500 different champagnes. Dom Perignon in here, Cristal in there. The most prized vintages are so valuable, they're kept under lock and key. It's all the good stuff. <laughs> this is his private cellar. <laughs> Look at that. Uh, here we have... What do you want to show us? Oh, it's a little young wine. One of my first purchases here. Really? <laughs> 1982. So how much would that Petrus 82 be? It's about 20,000. Wow. Yeah. What about this one? This is an 18... Uh, let's have a look. You've got to handle that really carefully. Oh. 18... Oh, my God, is that not going to fall? No. Uh -huh. 1868. Do you think it's good? Delicious. The last one I tried was really perfect. It's incredible that some of these wines are over 150 years old and still as good, even better than when they were bottled. But during service, how do the staff quickly locate a bottle of wine, let alone get it all the way up to the dining room in a matter of minutes? It all starts when the order is dropped seven floors down a pipe to be collected by full-time cellar boy and sommelier in training, Stephen. Now the bell has rung. I got my order. OK. What have we got here? Hermitage Red Chave, 1999. OK. So here we go to find it out. All right. Yeah. OK, so I follow you. So, Stephen, how long did it take you to find a bottle of wine? Actually, it takes me about two minutes. Two minutes? Wow! <laughs> this is where you are. Yeah, this is where I am. This is like the trenches, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it is. it is. You've got to have a good outside to see where it is. Yeah. So how many hours of the day are you down here? 12 hours, some days. Uh... But that's really nice for me, because I, um, I appreciate to be alone, to be in the cold, too. So you like the cold? That, uh, yeah, I really like the cold. So that job was made for me. There are hundreds of meters of corridor down here, over two floors. During service, Stephen will have to send around 35 bottles up to the restaurant. You know where you're going? Yeah, I know uh, where I'm going. Well, good job, because I have no idea. I learned the map of the cellar. So I'm looking for the 19 bis, this one. That's the one. Right, so we've got to set it up now. Yeah. So I put the wine in the basket. OK. So the wine is not disturbed. OK. I put it here. And then it goes and up. It goes up. The wine takes its own lift up to the sixth floor, ready for the sommeliers to serve. La Tour d'Argent offers the modern diner a taste of Parisian history, and we'll be back to meet the chef who's trying to regain the lost Michelin stars. Classic French cuisine doesn't have to come with fancy wine and a big price tag. The next stop on Michel's list is reviving one of the simplest and cheapest French classics. It's north of the Seine, in the city's first arrondissement, just a few blocks from the world's largest museum. The Louvre. So after last night, mega blowout at La Tour d'Argent, it was a blowout, wasn't it? It was. It really was. And I'm going to prove to you that in Paris, in France, you don't have to go to these great, big, expensive places. You can also eat the simplest of food. And I'm talking about a ham sandwich. Oh, I love a jambon beurre. <laughs> jambon beurre, not ham sandwich. You know, this is one of my favorite food. I used to eat that when I was a kid, you know, when I was going back from football, have my old chocolate, watch a bit of TV. That was the life. I know exactly what you mean, because when I was an apprentice here in Paris, that was my meal. Every night, I'd have le jambon beurre. And a jambon beurre, when it's made properly with great ingredients, I tell you, it is a meal fit for kings. Three million jambon beurre are sold every day in France. But this icon now faces a threat, as for the first time in 2017, he was outsold by the burger, with nearly 1.5 billion consumed that year. Michel's heard of a man trying to revive the jambon beurre and reclaim its spot as France's number one fast food lunch. Right, this is Rue Saint-Honoré. This street is full of little bars, patisseries, serving up great food. Here we go. This tiny little place here. 
Nice. This is nice, hein? Very nice. How are you? Bonjour. Bienvenue. Merci. Que puis-je faire pour vous, messieurs? Well, I think we like a couple of sandwiches. Yeah, sure. Jambon you beurre. You want to try a jambon beurre? Yes, sure. jambon beurre, yes. Yeah. Which one do you want? The traditional Parisian with pickles and ham and salty butter? Uh -huh. Or a spicy one with piment d'espelette? A spicy one for him because he's the naughty one. <laughs> okay, I have a traditional one. Sure. Okay, perfect. Frustrated by a distinct lack of good traditional sandwiches, friends Stéphane and Rodolphe quit their day job as bankers and set out to produce the best jambon beurre in Paris. I love the fact that you are championing le jambon beurre. Le jambon beurre for me is, is just part of my heritage as a Frenchman. Yes. And what do you I mean a Frenchman? You're not French. I'm more French than you, mate. No, I am more French than you. Just because you got... Where were you born? Just because you where got... Where were you born? Never you mind where, where I was Where were born. you born? In Kent. <laughs> Excuse my friend here. Excuse him. Here, you know. Everything is made to order, including the classic ham and butter, alongside Stéphane's own variations. We can make different sandwich during all the year, so that depends on the season. But your, your, your best seller is the jambon beurre. Our best seller is the jambon beurre. Our name is jambon beurre, so we make the best jambon beurre in Paris. <laughs> it is one thing to claim it, it's another thing to prove it. So what makes your sandwich the best sandwich in Paris? We use the best product in it. Mm -hmm. We use a, a really good baguette, it's from Gosselin. They made the, the bread for Elysée. For the French president? Yeah, for the French president, sure. So you will eat the, the French president bread. So you're lucky too. And our butter is Bordier butter, a really famous yeah. brand in France. And we've got Am, and we are lucky in Paris because we've got uh, Dumbea. They make the Prince of Paris. This is the last Am made in Paris. And it's really nice, it's artisanal. How generous that is. Yeah. Uh, sure, that is. it must be generous. That's what it's all about. For me, that's, that's a complete meal. My traditional jambon beurre is simply salted butter with artisan ham and gherkins. Michel's has a smoky pepper-infused butter with chopped chives. They are five euro fifty each, but it's a big baguette, so great value if it's as good as they say it is. I just love the smell of this bread. For me, it just brings back so many good memories. You know what I love about these guys? They, they are reinventing tradition, a tradition that is being completely lost now, because people romanticize about France, about finding this great little restaurant alongside a motorway. You can't find them anymore, can you? But they are doing it. You know what? I'd love to know how they make this ham. And in all my years of being a chef and being a pastry apprentice, I've never made a baguette. You've never learned how to make a baguette? Never. You, Not once. The great Michel Roux yes. Jr. But first, it's time for lunch. And where better to picnic with a jambon beurre than Michel's favorite spot at Montmartre in the shadow of the Sacré Coeur? <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Nothing better. Allez, on right. y va. This is a moment of truth. Oh, yeah. I'm so looking forward to and this. Look at this baguette. Wow. Que bon grand. On parle pas de la bouche pleine, hein? <laughs> Not pas la bouche pleine. You've seen this bread. It's lovely, crust, crunchy. I'm going to taste the ham on its own. The ham is delicious. Oh, yeah. Mmm! It's lightly smoked. Mm. Yeah, it's beautiful. Just look, look at the bread. Look how beautiful it is. No, it's beautiful. I have to say, the gherkin just... No. Is that little bit of a... No, 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 no. Just give it a little edge. I think the one with the piment de spelet is better. But you've got the spicy butter. I'm more of a purist. I like my ham sandwich with just butter. That's it. No, but this fancy butter, no, it's not for me. It's good. I'm sure it's good. But this is the best. I can't believe we're, we're here in Montmartre and we're arguing about the quality of butter in a ham sandwich. Yeah, but I'm right. <laughs> and you know it. It's the best bread and ham that make this jambon beurre so good. But how do you make outstanding artisan produce in a city that's struggling to retain its culinary heritage? To find out, Michel is going to bake his first baguette at Stéphane's supplier, the Gosselin Bakery. They produce everything on site from mouse-watering macaroons, tarte aux fraises and many more delightful French classics. Oh, wow. That's what I love about Paris. Beautiful, classic patisserie. 
and baguettes. Oh gosh, it smelled so good in here. And it's busy. Bonjour, madame. Uh, Monsieur Gosselin? Oui, il est par là. Je peux? Merci. Oh. Well, here we go. <laughs> this is like going down into a submarine. Oh, my word. Philippe Gosselin's family have been running bakeries for over 100 years, and he's been making baguettes all his life. Ah! <laughs> Monsieur Gosselin. Gosselin has won the coveted Best Baguette in Paris award, and he supplied the presidential Elysee Palace with daily bread and croissants. An achievement in a city with more than a thousand bakeries. Donc là, on est en train de donc on est en train de mixer au pétrin. Donc là, en fait, compte notre recette. Il y, a, il y a juste quatre, quatre éléments, c'est l'eau, la levure, le sel et la farine. French Law states a true Parisian baguette can only be made with these four ingredients using no preservatives or additives. Quelle est la différence entre euh, la, la baguette parisienne et une baguette euh, normale Déjà, la baguette, c'est parisien. Après <laughs> les autres... <laughs> yeah, first off, baguette, it's parisien. Voilà. Because Paris was such a big city, uh, there were lots of boulangers, and they were making little baguettes that, and cooking them throughout the day, two or three times a day. Uh, whereas in the countryside, uh, le pain campagne, the country-style bread, was a big bread that would keep for a week because you would only go once a week to the baker. Philippe controls the mixer, slowly kneading the dough for around an hour to stretch the gluten and give the bread its springy texture. Comment vous savez que, quand elle est prête? On sait qu'elle est prête, en fin de compte, parce qu'en fin de compte, déjà, on évite qu'elle chauffe, vous voyez. Et puis là, on arrive à avoir un diagramme. Oh, wow! Ah oui. It should be completely translucent. You should be able to see your hand through it. There it is, look. Beautiful. Gossima. This is incredible. This is a true master at work. They produce over 2,000 baguettes a day here in this tiny kitchen. Philippe believes the key to a perfect baguette lies in letting the dough proof for two hours at a cool two degrees. This delays the activation of the yeast, resulting in a sweeter, nuttier baguette. Voilà. Qui reste de pâte dans le bac? 19 year old Pedro has been Philippe's apprentice for four years. So the apprentice is teaching me how to do this. I love it. So very important to push it into the corners, because this dividing machine, as you can see, will divide it up equally. Ultimately, you want each baguette to weigh exactly the same. Otherwise, you're going to have some very unhappy customers. Grumpy Parisians, and there's nothing worse. On ferme? On ferme. Petit cac un peu de pâte déborde. C'est bon. Ah, ouais. Yes. Hop, et là. Comment, comment tu te ressens d'être partie d'une équipe euh, comme, comme ça, là, qui, qui, qui fait du, du beau pain, du pain qui, est, qui a gagné une médaille et qui est servi à l'Elysée Ah bah c'est un honneur, et franchement, je, je suis content d'être ici. Hein. This bread he's making right here, this one here, might end up on the president's table. C'est vrai. Each piece of dough is placed in a rolling machine to gently stretch it before being moved to a cloth or couche for further stretching by hand. Now, if it was an industrial baguette, all of this would be mechanized and it's just wrong. All this is real. It's still got that human element. Every baguette will be slightly different. It's lovely. I just, I'm so, so enjoying this. Michel's baguettes proof for another 30 minutes, this time in the warmest corner of the kitchen. Meanwhile, a few miles away, I'm in the middle of a housing estate, the surprising home of Dumbea, the last traditional Parisian ham factory. Hey, bonjour. Hello, Hello Fred. How are you? Telephone? Yes. Okay. All right. Put the equipment. Okay. Yves Le Guel, a retired chemist, bought this business in 2005 in a bid to save a 17th century Parisian technique of ham production. I think it's perfect. I want to look size. like a doctor now. Yes. Always wanted to be a doctor. 
OK, we go now. All right. The arteries of whole arm joints are injected with a saumure. Like a stock, this closely guarded recipe flavors the meat with herbs and spices, while a high concentration of salt preserves it. If you're vegetarian, look away. So what's the difference between this and the modern process? For the modern process, you have a big machine, and the people don't use the same ham. They use different parts of different animals, and they mix it. I can't help to think that the secret, really, of what you're doing, I mean, it's in that saumure. It's in your secret recipe, isn't it? Yes, it's secret. The life of the company depends on the secret. We use only the uh, vegetable uh, on other things that are very natural. So you got vegetables in there? Some vegetables. Carrots? No, I'm not sure. And how did you come up with that recipe? <laughs> he doesn't want to tell me anything. <laughs> to keep the ham whole, the bones are removed with surgical precision and knives so sharp the butchers have to wear a chainmail suit. It's so skillful. I mean, I'm fascinated by the way that they get this bone out. I would love to try. I but feel completely incapable, incapable to do it. The hams are soaked in the saumur for 24 hours, then slowly cooked in the brine for a further nine hours before being put in the fridge for a week to absorb the flavor. So if I wanted to buy a ham now, how much would they cost? The cost is around uh, 30 euro per kilo. Packed ham back home is about 20 pounds a kilo. So this seems a decent price for an authentic product that preserves the city's tradition. Delicious. All I need now is a little bit of a butter and a baguette. Ah, yes. Why not? That'd be perfect. Back at the bakery, Michel is finishing those iconic French baguettes. I love the fact that we're underneath the shop in this tiny little space. Uh, and, and, you know, part of, part of Parisian heritage. Before the baguettes are placed in the oven, they receive the baker's signature mark. Il faut que ça soit vraiment léger. Hein. Léger? Ouais. Cinq, hein? Avec ah. oula, c'est pas mal sûr. I've never done this before. Hopefully, voilà. they're okay. Et après, on met ça au four. Feel the heat suddenly, woof. So in they go, 260 degrees centigrade and a blast of uh, water. And the water's in there to make steam so as you get that lovely golden crust on the bread. It's beautiful, let's have a little peek. Wow, they're already rising. I'm excited when I see the bread cooking and all of this because, you know, I don't do this every day. He does, he's, you know. <laughs> After just 16 minutes, the baguettes are ready. Oh, yeah, look at that. <gasps> this is what Paris is all about. Beautiful baguettes. On a l'odeur, et en fait, on l'entend. On entend le pain chanter. Ouais. On va l'ouvrir comme ça. Voilà. Regardez-moi toutes ces bulles. On a, une, on a la mie. De la dentelle. Et c'est ça qui est bon, tu vois. What we saw earlier when he was making the dough, you could see it, it was as thin as gossamer. And it was really holding well. Well, you can see that here. Big bubbles, super thin, and structure. But it's not cotton wool. It's got that great texture. The crumb is amazing, and that lovely, lovely crisp crust. Listen. The bread is singing, he said. It's singing. Eat me. Simple food made well with passion may win awards. But at La Tour d'Argent, they are aiming for the highest accolade in the culinary world, three Michelin stars. According to the guide itself, to live from one to three stars, they will need to change from a place with high quality cooking worth a stop to one with exceptional cuisine worth a special journey. Wow! Ah, amazing. So we're putting on our professional ads to see just how they are attempting to make this massive step while keeping their traditional roots. I haven't seen chefs wearing hats like that since I was at catering college. It's like we're back in Ratatouille. 
<laughs> Almost. Yeah, yeah. right there to territory. It's smart and it's respect for oneself as well. To look smart, to look clean, to look the part. They are looking to gain their three stars again. I mean, what do you think they have to do to bring it back to three stars? I mean, the service is definitely three stars. It's all down to the food, isn't it? Yes. In the kitchen, there are 20 chefs who serve 60 covers twice a day. They are overseen by head chef Philippe Labbé, who was employed two years ago and given the challenge of regaining the lost Michelin stars. How are you, chef? Okay. Bonjour. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. Philippe has a pedigree running two and three Michelin star restaurants, but here has the unique challenge to create a bold, innovative menu while still offering dishes that have been served here for over a century. Is that the famous duck? Yes, it's a famous duck. Who started that dish? Who was a chef at the time? Do you know? It's Frédéric Dolaire. He, he was not a cook. He was a waiter. <laughs> he was a waiter. <laughs> yes. And he invented this famous duck. Yes. That you guys are now claiming. <laughs> you are claiming it. You should never have told him that. <laughs> the ducks, stuffed with garlic, herbs and butter, are seasoned, ready for roasting. All of this seasoning inside, the salt, the pepper, is attention to detail because when that cooks, it's going to infuse the meat from the inside. And they're not forgetting that they're going to use the carcass and all the juices to make the sauce. So people come from all over the world to eat this. All over the world. Your hope is to one day achieve the holy grail, which mm. is three Michelin stars. Do you think it's possible, even with the old recipes of the duck? Of course. Of course. What is important in this restaurant, you know, it's a story of French cuisine. Yes. To keep the style and the idea and the spirit of this house so and the good. owner, but do with a modern style. Yes. Roasted duck in the oven, it's a classical way, but it's a technique too. And Michelin don't forget this. They never forget that. Ah. This is an iconic dish. Who is allowed to cook this duck? One person of me. One, one chef here yeah. and you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody else. Each duck is roasted for 20 minutes to get the juices flowing before carving to produce this now legendary dish. Meanwhile, Next door in the dining room, the front of our team meticulously prepares for service. Everyone has a specific job to do. Thomas is solely responsible for the silver. What is your actual job title? Je suis le gardien de l'argenterie. And the guard. You are the guardian, the custodian of the silver. Mm -hmm. Shall I give you a hand? I was very good in my days. I used to be so fast at polishing the silver. Uh, voir vraiment le changement des couleurs. Do you feel emotional when you polish the pressoir here? I mean, this is more than 100 years old. La première fois que j'ai nettoyé, oui, c'était très émouvant. The I can't believe it. He cried the first time he polished that press. It's incredible. One truly unique role is a canardier or duck waiter. Olivier has been faithfully serving the ducks and making the traditional sauce for 20 years. You know, when you think about restaurants, you know, it's always about the chef. But for the customers who are here, you know, when the restaurant is full, they don't see the chef. They, no, they see don't. you. Yes, that's you right, are yes. the face of La Tour d'Argent. That's right, yes. I love and that. I you. love <laughs> that. I can't tell you how much I love thank it. You. you look very I'm happy. Good. I mean, yes. you're smiling. I'm, I'm very happy to prepare it in front of the customers. I like to do it, and this is my passion. We are not only waiters to put plates on the table, but we are doing a real job for the customer. Passion and professionalism are the bedrock of La Tour d'Argent. Mix that with some of Philippe's contemporary touches in the kitchen, and it's clear this is a traditional place trying to evolve. Most restaurants, chefs would not go that side, and waiters would not go this side. Here, it's totally different. It's a collaboration between the front and the back of house. But the most important thing is in the cooking. And we don't say nothing. <laughs> <laughs> in total, there are 81 staff working here, be it front of house, in the cellar, or in the kitchen, and everyone has a unique job to do. A key ingredient in several of Philippe's dishes, including his contemporary milk and honeycomb dessert, is honey. 
And on the roof, there is a whole new workforce you wouldn't find in any conventional restaurant. Ça va, Fred? Enchanté? Oui. Okay, is this for me? Oui. Fantastic. You're not wearing one? No. It's like being an astronaut, isn't it? Yes, it is. Sibyl is a professional beekeeper. She may choose not to wear a veil, but it's not right for an amateur like me. They look very, very calm, these bees. Yes, they are normally. I would not tolerate naughty colonies. This is such a special place to keep bees. I mean, I mean, look at this. I mean, you've got Notre Dame, the Eiffel Tower, the Invalides. I mean, the sun is just there. So who would have thought it that the center of Paris is a perfect place for beekeeping? But look at all the trees you can see from here. Yeah, so this is a lot of food for the bees. Sibyl keeps bees in 80 different rooftop sites around Paris. Not only do they supply the restaurant with honey, but help increase the biodiversity of the area. I've never been so close to a bee before. <laughs> They're so beautiful, look at them. Do you talk to them? Yes, normally in French, but I do talk to them. If you see, that shiny part is nectar, yeah. and when it's capped, it's honey. Do you want to try? Yeah. You just go like this. Oh, and then lovely. I really, really do love honey. Mmm. How much honey do they produce? Mm, 20 kilos per hive. Per year? It's per a lot. Year, yeah. This is brilliant. Because <laughs> I have a restaurant which is on the 28th floor in London. Oh, that's a bit high for the bees, I think. Is it too high? Yeah. Because they've got to go up. Uh, got wings. Charge, yes, but charge with the uh, nectar, and that can be very, very heavy for a very tiny bee. Oh, tiny little bees. <laughs> Sibyl and her bees are one of the ways La Tour d'Argent is introducing new ideas, not to replace tradition, but to add something extra special. The restaurant is a living embodiment of old Parisian gastronomy, which can never leave its past behind. To meet all these people, I mean, they live and breathe what they do. It's not a job, it's a vocation. It's like a cast, and each member of this team, you know, is playing a part in, in this beautiful production. I was a little bit worried bringing you here to La Tour d'Argent because it's, it's, it's got a certain style and, and it's a certain formality. No, I know what you mean. It's old school, but it's not stuffy. I love it. I feel at home, you know, because it's special. It makes you feel like it's an experience. It and is. It's, there's it... nothing like it. From Michelin star restaurants to lunch on the run, no matter where you are in the league table of French eateries, if you know the right places, you can find some of the highest standards in the world. The final stop in Michel's little black book is south of the river in Montparnasse. A great part of the city. My apprenticeship was in Montparnasse. And it means so much to me. It's, it's, it's like my stomping ground. Part of the city that, uh, that really came to life when Picasso moved from Montmartre to Montparnasse. I mean, Picasso was a force of nature. Wherever he went, you know, poof, life exploded. And people followed. It's true. Montparnasse became a hub for artistic and intellectual life in the 20s, or les années folles, the crazy years. And in a bid to cater for the new residents' insatiable appetite for fine food and booze, the brasserie boomed, offering all day drinking and dining. OK, Fred, I'm going to take you to Somewhere really special, somewhere I really love. There it is, La Coupole. I mean, it's one of the brasseries I've never visited, you know? You know what? And as a 16-year-old, I tried to go in, but I was not suitably dressed, yeah? So what did I do? I went round the corner, took my sock off, put it around my neck. I looked like a neckerchief, looked really smart, really cool. Did it work? Nah, like hell. I got kicked out. Maybe it was a smelly sock. <laughs> <laughs> La Coupole was established in 1927 and immediately became popular with the likes of Picasso, Sartre and Hemingway. This place is gigantic. It's the biggest brasserie dining room in Paris, seating 300 and another 100 on the terrace. Hey, seafood counter. Amazing. That's what I want. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Monsieur, bonjour. Bienvenue à la Coupole. Hello, how are you? Super. You like to do lunch? Yes. At the bottom of French eateries is the café or bistro. At the top, the Michelin-star places. 
and right in the middle lies the brasserie. Uh, you can have the comfy one. OK, merci. <laughs> they promise to be everything to everyone with a vast array of dishes served from morning until midnight. I feel like the king. We are kings. That's the thing. Everybody is a king here. There are over 30 main dishes on the brasserie's large menu, from lamb curry to beef tartare and lobster ravioli. Their two-course set menu is 1950, while their most expensive seafood platter, the Royal, is 89 euros a head. I mean, the crustacea, you know, is off the menu, if you look at it, in terms of the, yeah. the space it takes for the menu, so that must be a big salad. It's got to be, isn't it? And there is something for everybody here. You can come in here, maybe just have a little salad, a glass of wine, maybe a bit of cheese. That's it, you're done. Great classics, you know, things like an andouillette, tripe sausage. I never could eat the andouillette. I can't do the You're andouillette. French and you don't eat andouillette? What can I do? <laughs> What's so French? <laughs> what can I do? I don't like andouillette. <gasps> it's because you're old. You know, when you get old, you like this strong taste. I can't believe I've invited you to here, and, you, and now you're treating me of an oldie. La Coupole is famous for its seafood platters. There is a whole counter dedicated to them in full view of the dining room. The six varieties start at 29 euros a head for the tasting platter of oysters. Oui. Oui, oui, mer, I think, for us. Shall we? Yes, it's got to be, hasn't it? Merci. Et avec des frites aussi à côté. Merci beaucoup. Vous en you know what I like here is the efficiency of the service. He hasn't wasted his time. He took our order, very professional, very simple, no time wasted. Efficiency, exactly yes. that. And you need to be efficient when you're in a brassie like this. With service running non-stop throughout the day, the waiters can reset the tables up to eight times. These waiters, when they walk, they look like Mo Farah doing the 10,000 meters. How many staff do you think they have? I mean, 300 covers? You need a heck of a lot of stuff. And the menu, I mean, the menu is vast. How many chefs are working away in that kitchen? I mean, the logistics of a place like this, it, it really is incredible. Aha! Here we go. Here we go. Oh, wow. Mm. We've gone for the mid-range coupole platter at 45 euros each. This stunning display consists of cockles, clams, whelks, prawns, and six oysters. This is wonderful. I think it looks great. This is so French brasserie. Let's get tucked in. You ready? Mm. They're delicious, these oysters, eh? Some people say you shouldn't chew the oyster, but that's ridiculous. No, you chew them. Of course. Savour all those lovely flavours of the sea. We French love our oysters. The country produces 150,000 tonnes a year, and La Coupole can serve up to 700 a day. Shellfish constitute an incredible 20% of sales here, but sourcing these quantities must be a huge challenge. The scale of it, I mean, is very different from what we do. Very, very different. Washed down with a bit of champagne, our meal came to around 120 euros. Big treat. Look, we went large. We went on the uh, Plateau de Fruits de Mer, beautiful oysters. It's never going to be cheap. But, I mean, look where we are. Yeah. We are one of the people who've eaten here, like Sartre and Mitterrand. They will say, you know, in 100 years, this is where Michel <laughs> Roux and Fred Sirieck sat. <laughs> this Art Deco dining room is buzzing with customers from all walks of Parisian life. How does this almost century-old brasserie continue to offer its huge menu to so many diners each day in a city where costs are rising and a restaurant culture is changing fast. On est là pour un fish, une gambas. Acting head chef Jean is part of the 52 strong kitchen team responsible for delivering this demanding menu. Comment ça marche, la chef? How, how, how does it work, chef? Nous avons tous les ronds de la salle. Uh, ils me sortent les bons ici. J'annonce au cuisinier. Ils me répondent. Ils me donnent le temps. Je le mets ici. So it's not much different to, to the restaurant system that we have, except just on a much bigger scale. Yeah. Il faut être concentré, quoi. Hein? Oui, oui. Là, le midi, on n'a rien du tout. C'est facile. Très facile. <laughs> There's only about 150 covers booked. On réclame deux poitrines de veau. Deux minutes. Alors, deux minutes pour deux main courses. It means really that everything is ready to go. Ready. Yeah, it's all about the preparation. You know, you've got to be ready for service. Yeah, there's nothing that's prepared last minute. You know, what's incredible, Fred, as well, there's only three people actually cooking on the range here. 
So everything is prepped beforehand, ready to go, just finished. Last bit of sauce on it, and out it goes. Cuisine d'assemblage. Yeah. I want to know the record number of covers you've done here in a day. 1,900 covers. You know, it's almost like a, a military operation. Everything has to be ready for the big kickoff. So how do you continue to convince this huge number through the door on a very traditional menu? It's got to be a quality offering, and getting the right ingredients is key, especially with something so simple yet so spectacular as a seafood platter. The next morning, while Mr. Roux is still in bed, I'm up at 3 a.m. to meet the brasserie seafood supplier at the world's largest wholesale food market. Excited to be here. I love it. I love all this activity, the buzz. You know, all these people who are working here. You know, this is a proper workers' place. Rangis Food Market is a beating heart of the city's restaurant industry, running through the night to keep up with demand. Five miles south of the city, at 578 acres, it's larger than Watford. It employs around 25,000 people, and its abundance of fresh produce reaches 18 million consumers a year. And La Coupole buys everything here. Bonjour, monsieur. Bonjour. Comment ça va? Bonjour, monsieur. Tout se passe bien? Oui, ça va. Super. Je cherche uh, James. Ah, mais tu es là, James. Où ça? Là-bas. Juste là-bas. Ah, James? Bonjour, Fred, enchanté. Ok. Ça va, tout va bien? Tout va bien. Fantastique, merci. Et alors là, vous avez préparé le, la commande pour euh, la coupole? Tout à fait. C'est une grosse commande ou? C'est une belle commande par rapport aux autres clients. Ah, d'accord. Oui, un des plus gros clients. Oui. Trois cartons de homard, les langoustines, c'est pour lui aussi. James has worked for this wholesale fishmonger for 14 years. Prior to that, he worked as a buyer for La Coupole, so he knows exactly what they are after. Combien ils font de de kilos de homard les à La Coupole? 10%. 10% du chiffre. Ouais. On met trois, un kilo de grise. Un kilo de crevettes grises, des bigorneaux cuits. Ouais. As today's delivery makes its way to the brasserie, it's clear this enormous market is exactly the sort of modern infrastructure La Coupole relies on to get their varied produce at a good price. At the brasserie, Karim is responsible for checking all the deliveries, as many as 15 a day. Wow. Yeah, all that. Oui. It's incredible, the amount of orders. I mean, in my restaurant, I put the order through in five minutes, I've finished. 416 euros just on dry goods for the day. Wow, lobsters, this, here's, a big, here's a really big order. 1,204 euros here. Well, uh, so we'll have about... What, 70 homards? Oh, environ, oui. C'est incroyable, mais, mais combien vous dépensez ici euh, par jour? Entre 6 000 à 10 000 euros. Oh! Tout au oh. Oui. C'est une machine, une machine de guerre ici. Là. Tout à fait. Il y a beaucoup de travail, c'est très intense à l'économie. Et euh, c'est une question aussi de, d'organisation, de méthode. Alors, Karim, si euh, par exemple la, la commande elle n'est pas juste, il manque quelque chose, est-ce que c'est Karim qui le prend sur le dos s'il manque quelque chose Oui. <rire> oui. <rire> <laughs> C'est pas facile d'être chef d'économie. It's not non, easy to be in charge of the uh, <laughs> deliveries here. <laughs> With supplies in for the day, the pressure moved to front of house to get it sold. I'm on the seafood counter with Mohamed. Tiens, numéro 3 là. Numéro 3 ici. Up to 250 kilos of seafood is sold from here a day. And it's the job of a tiny two-man team to make sure it catches the customer's eye. We should put Another one there. That would be prettier, no? Okay. On a busy day, it takes half a ton of ice to keep this perishable produce fresh and displayed to draw the customers in. Hey, chef. You're right, Fred. Yeah. This is a cool setup. It's huge. But of course, the real spectacle lies in preparing one of the six show-stopping seafood platters. This is the big one. This is the Royal. The Royal. Look at the speed that these, these guys are working. Yeah, and you're not working. I want to see you opening oysters. Come on, man. OK, what oysters shall I get? Two special Gilardo, number right. three. Two special L'Imperatrice. OK, hold on. Hold Two Fin de Claire. Looking see how he does them. I mean, this is very, very difficult to do. These guys make it look really, really easy. Can look. you imagine when they get, like, five or six of these on order? You've got to be pressure. so fast. 
This extravagant royal platter is half a lobster, half a crab, three langoustines, eight oysters of four different varieties, cockles, clams, prawns, shrimps, whelks, and winkles. Very good. Well done, chef. Beautiful. Oh, yes. Beautiful. Attention to detail. These little langoustine, they clip them there. It's almost dancing. Look at that. Beautiful. Every platter is presented beautifully, each one an advert for the next. Theatre. This is what this place is all about. With minimal cooking and staff needed to present each platter, it's a good way to turn a profit. Thank you, merci. Be careful, don't break your back, chef. <laughs> By specializing in these spectacular platters, and working with a modern supply system like Rangis, La Coupole can compete with more contemporary restaurants and continue to offer the classic brasserie experience on a vast scale. Can you imagine, you've got about 4,000 plates. Hey, this is hey, a very hey, important let's, department. Let's chat and get a move on, all right? My first job, I was a KP. I was the fastest. Come on, Freddy boy, come on. Chef, you are just not used to art, where are you? In this huge chain of production, there will always be the washing up to think about. It's not gonna wash properly. A single tray of washing up will pass through the machine in two minutes and 40 seconds. The real skill here is keeping up with it. That is one heck of a machine. The next thing you do is this. All right. <laughs> Rather like the washing up, this place an endless conveyor belt of production. But on this scale, to be all things to all people all day, it has to be. Out front, no one would ever know. This is what the Grand Brasseries are all about for me. You understand what the founders wanted to do. Yes, the food is good, but it's not all about the food. It's about the heritage, the history, the, the conviviality of this place. You come in here, whether you're spending 10 euros or 100 euros, and you enjoy the moment. And you feel exactly the same as the table next door. This style of brasserie has been replicated time and time again all over the world. All over the world, but this is the original. But you can't copy and paste Sartre, Mitterrand, Hemingway, Fred and Michel. Do you think we've got to open some more oysters? I, I don't know about opening them, but I'd love to eat them. <laughs> Tradition is a valuable commodity. And in Paris, they know just how to make it part of the whole experience of eating. The Parisians, they are passionate. They, they love everything that they do. They're not reinventing the wheel. You know, the Jean Bonbeur has been around for forever and a day. Tour d'Argent has been around for hundreds of years. La Coupole since 1927. But they're doing it well. These three places are linked with one word, heritage. It's about reaching people's heart, making them happy. And that's why they're still around and still relevant now. Next time, I'm in San Sebastian. Oh, this is beautiful. With restaurateur Nisha Katona. This is the ultimate city for eating. A little black book is packed with the most exciting places to eat. Oh, this is a little... Pig's head in a city obsessed with cuisine. <laughs> I want to stay here. Stay here. And I want to die at this bar. <laughs> That's what I want to do. Here.